Hey everyone, welcome, welcome back here to my channel where I play Plan Zoo. My name is Nissa, and today we are building for our first modded animal, being the Asian blue bull. We are also giving it a few friends in here, being the Asian small clawed otter and the Malayan tapir. However, I will mainly focus today on the Asian blue quill since it's the only animal here I haven't built for it before. So, if you want to learn a little bit about that or simply see how I build this habitat, then please keep watching. First of all, I'm just gonna start by uh, stealing the house here from our little blue penguins and that's because I actually intended while building that and I believe I also said that in the video that this would be a full building and not a half building uh, as it looks before. So that's gonna be great to get that finished and I think it will also be pretty great even though we are pretty far south <laughs> um, and I don't think they will have as much rain as we have here up in the north uh, but still rains do appear sometimes and it would be really nice just to be able to just for a moment go in and have that roof over your head so you can dry up a little bit However, once again, we have a fairly... <laughs> uh, I won't tell... Actually, it's a simple habitat to build, I feel. But it is a habitat that will take time. Uh, therefore, you will also see a few extra cuts today, which is basically just put in here. Uh, so you don't have to see me put in e every single little stone. And every time I go in and try to fix the water level, it I have tried to cut it so you can see I fixed the water level. But it's because I want this to work um, really, really nice. And uh, as you know, the glass uh, fence here is pretty much the only thing you can use for this. But it can conflict with the path system and you cannot make the water flux with the uh, glass fence so you need to fix the uh, make the water first and then draw down the glass fence it took some time so i have cut all of those out so you will have some extra cuts but i do believe it makes this video more con uh what's the word um more easy to see. We will also put in a little keeper hut here. I have sewn uh, every animal here on the water tunnel. Um, so this keeper hut will be kind of in the middle on, on a bit. So they kind of have a keeper hut in there. So you don't have to walk too far with it. Especially because both habitats in this middle thing. Little blue penguin and the one we are building now with the Asian blue quill. The Asian small clawed otter and the Malayan tapir. Both habitats will hold quite a lot of animals. So I thought they will need a lot of food. And it will be really heavy to carry too far. So this was the best outcome I believe. I'm still a little conflicted by my choice to put this habitat here and that's because here I made the space for two aquatic habitats but instead I made one really big habitat uh, but only half aquatic meaning that I actually had a spot for more water that I didn't use so when you go through the tunnel there will be a part where you can only see habitats on one side and I'm not sure if it's the right choice, I honestly still don't know. But I just think otters especially is one of the most magical creatures you can see in an underwater habitat. So I thought they would be perfect for this. Uh, I know the Malayan tape here also do swim, but you won't really... You can see the bottom of them when they swim because they won't dive. Um, so yeah, I, I still haven't made my choice, but then again, uh, my original idea was actually the saltwater crocodile, but they do not live this far north as far as I could figure. So the idea would be that they would be local, but there actually isn't any crocodilians as far as I could see local to this region. Uh, so instead we go with some non-local animals that are not crocodilians. <laughs> because I'm that logical. I will try to fit in four specific biomes within this habitat, which will be uh, the water area. Of course, then we will have a very rocky area. These are not 
rocky living animals, but I do believe that it's the best way to work around the tunnel underneath because you cannot use uh, terrain. I did try, but it's too... Um, it's not high enough. If it's way higher, I could, but I can't. So that's pretty much the reason for that. Then we will have a little beachy area and a very, very tropical foresty area. Our three beautiful animals we built for today could actually be found in the same uh, places, being that these all live in Southeast Asia in this little island group, basically between mainland Asia and mainland Australia. Uh, I will say though, where the Malayan tapir only live in Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar and Thailand, which both of our other animals live, the uh, Asian blue quill go a little further south also and live on uh, mainland Australia, uh, but also places like China, Taiwan, uh, Papua, New Guinea, India, Onai, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Mi Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, T Thailand, Timor Leste, and Vietnam. However, the most widespread of them probably is the Asian small cloud otter, living in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Onai, Cambodia, China, India, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. Because of all of these areas, these ocean, sorry, Asian small cloud of the live, they also have the most biomes. They are also the most aquatic animal here, so it does make sense. Uh, so we have, of course, the rivers, coastal, freshwater, riparian, marine, interior zones, wetlands, neurotic, historic marsh swamps, and black fish border for water-based biomes. Then we also have the drier places like the scrublands, anthropogenic grassland and forest. However, no matter which of these, they will have to both have a non-aquatic biomes combined with the aquatic biomes because these are sub-aquatic animals. The king quill actually also have a few aquatic-based biomes being freshwater and wetlands. Uh, keep in mind that wetlands can is kind of a mix between so sometimes the entire ground can be filled with water but then it like a few centimeters or so and sometimes it can be these small uh, sprouts of many islands between uh, a little more deep water so it's kind of a mixture there uh, for drier uh, variations of biomes for them we have the anthropogenic the grassland and the scrublands which i believe all of them were, were also included in the asian small cloud order going for the malayan tape here we still have actually the woodlands like both of them and the swamps like the uh, asian small cloud order but we also include uh, for drier biomes we have the rainforest and the forest um so yeah you can actually find places in these on these islands where you can be lucky enough to at the same time see all three animals uh, keep in mind that two of these are fairly fast and fairly small so you probably need to put in the hours and just sit and wait and wait and wait to do so but it is technically plausible and just to make sure no one is confused, there's of course none of these animals that are native to King Island. And once again, from here on out, I'm gonna focus on the Asian blue quill. If you want to learn more about the other animals in here, I will either have talked about them in other videos, but I will also link below where I got my information from. So if you want to learn more about these animals, uh, I highly recommend you doing so because they are really cute, they are really cuddly, they are really, really amazing animals, like all animals are. But if you want to learn more about them, that is certainly one way to do so. The 
Okay, Asian blue quill actually have quite a few names, such as the blue breasted quill, the Chinese painted quill, Cheung Chi, or the King quill. Especially the last name is kind of weird, since it is the smallest of the true quills. It is, of course, in the 80s class, which is the cl animal class of everything that either is able to fly or at some point in their evolution would have been able to fly. They belong in the order of the Galliformes, which is the order of... Yeah, I'm gonna come with some examples. That's probably the easiest way to do this. So we have everything from the domesticated chicken to peafowls to turkeys to pheasants. Uh, so all of these are the land terrestrial uh, birds pretty much of course some of these can fly but doesn't really do it as their main transporting thing uh, where a lot of these you will mainly see just walk the land I will just mention that this is an order with 315 different species so there is of course more diverse birds than what i just mentioned then zooming in a little closer we are looking at the festi sorry festi and nidae uh, family which holds 195 different species this one would think were the fa family of the pheasants and that's only partially true because we still have the chicken the peafowl, the turkey, the, of course, pheasants and quails and, and more turkeys and more peafowls in here. So it's not like a really close, uh, only pheasants in here, but it is including those at least. And now we come to where I get a bit confused because looking at the genus, we are looking at this denos, denoscus. And uh, it have a list of three different species being the king quail or the Asian blue quail, which is the one we look at here. Then we have the brown quail and the blue quail. Yeah, the Asian blue quail and blue quail is not the same animal. The confusion here is with the description that this uh, Sinoicus is a genus of four species of old whale quills that are known as dwarf quills and they only list four and uh, i can get more confused than that because the first information we get about it uh, in the text about the asian blue quill is that it have nine different subspecies which i kind of want to know more about and what is even more confusing is normally the genus will be the first name in the latin name but here we have the Sunoicus, sorry Sunoicus genus but the latin name is excalfactoria chinesis which again doesn't even hold the genus so once again quite confused so I found multiple other websites that list their um, <laughs> Latin name as Coturnix Chinesis, which is the same last name but a different first name. But on these websites, it lists the first name of the uh, of the Latin name as the actual genus, and here it says that this is the genus of the Asian quail. So I assume it must be a mistake on animalia.bio I can't really confirm that and that's why I mentioned this uh, but it is what I currently are led to believe I will in addition link animaliadiversity.org uh, below as well as my other information uh, that confirms this these birds are fairly small with a total height of around 12 and a half centimeters being around five inches and a length of about 14 centimeters being around six inches 
they only weigh between 28 and 40 grams but keep in mind here that a lot of birds because of the way their bone structure if it's spilled normally will be much lighter than other kinds of animals at the same size the females are in general a little larger than the males having a little longer body and a little longer wings it is however a very small difference where the the male sorry the females wings uh, will have a length of between six and a half to 7.8 centimeters the males will only be between 6.6 .6 to 6.7 centimeters so the smallest will be the females but on average the females will be bigger once again here we have a animal where their name being the asian blue quill or the blue quill or all of the names that include blue it will only have something to do with the males which is why i understand that it seems to be more common that people go with the king quill uh, since it is not named after the coloration for the males the standard color will be the brown dark color on the back then we have this blue grayish coloration on the chest or breast area and then we have this either uh, chestnut or reddish coloration going on on the belly its throat however will have this beautiful coloration of black and white the female will only have part of these features where she will still have the brown coloration on the uh, back that can vary from the dark one as the males have to a lighter variations and the belly and uh, chest area will have this kind of rush brown color not as red as it is on the males and she will not have any of the blue coloration and neither the black and white colorations going on however there is a few features that both the males and females share being the black beaks the yellow to orange colored legs and feet as well as the short but dark brown tail however in captivity you can see both males and females with many other colorations going on which have been bred in in captivity meaning the version that i described is the naturally uh, occurring one and then it's just like cats and dogs and horses that when we get animals into captivity we kind of want to breed all of these kind of fantasy variations of them and sometimes it works however i will just mention as far as i could see on the mud i used here it, it will be linked below as long as well as my video on it it went up yesterday but as far as i have seen there's only the natural colorations of these birds within the mud birds do not have a specific mating season because of the fact that a lot of these different places they live will have a different rain seasons and during the rain season it would be really kind of stupid to have a lot of eggs keep in mind that eggs normally are uh, have a lot of holes in the shell it's not something a lot of people think about but there is all of these really 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 small holes and these eggs actually need to breathe which is why if you want egg to hatch you should not touch them too much with your fingers because you can clog these holes with moisture from your fingers and thereby kill the eggs so rain season wouldn't be good especially because these eggs are laid in hollows on the ground lined with grass so really really easy to flood since we have a structure here where we normally won't have a pairing or a mating pair or anything like that these quills doesn't hang around to see their offspring or at least the males do not the females do so the female will take care of the hatchling all of their own and the incubation of these eggs will take 16 to 19 very difficult days keep in mind how small these females are and the eggs 
are actually quite big not big for eggs but big for the um, size of the mother and she will lay between 6 and 14 eggs normally but it has been seen that she has laid as many as 21 eggs so it can be quite difficult to keep all of these eggs dry warm and humid for a extensive uh, period of time when these eggs hatch the hatchlings will not be much bigger than a bumblebee and for the nature color of these birds the babies will be brown but it is not uncommon in captivities when you have all these different colorations going on especially for the white colorations of these birds then the babies will become yellow instead this is something that you also can see with chickens in captivity that based on the color of the adult the babies will have a different color though still be most of the time very much different in color from the adult because these birds are pretty much beating the arch of still being able to survive in nature uh, i will just mention that a lot of these do not live that long and therefore these will have to kind of being able to breed on their own fairly soon so after they hatch they will actually move out be independent and kind of take the first steps to make their own little family and give their own babies already a month after that which is kind of a testament to why these are still thriving in nature though not living long at all in fact though you can't be lucky enough to have one in captivity that lived for about 13 years on average they will only live three to six years and in the wild this number is much much smaller when a average uh, asian blue quill only live for a year and a half on average this of course is more a testament for their fleeing ability being these are actually really easy to snatch they are fairly small so most predators can eat them whole without issues they do not run that fast they are not uh, able to protect themselves that well but because they can breed that fast and that many offsprings at the same time they are still able to keep the numbers up fairly well in most cases but it is for most animals that both have a strong breeding system in captivity and also live natural in the wild they actually have a few different eating plans in place in the wild they will normally eat bugs seeds and small grasses but in captivity it is recommended to give them a wide variety of seeds as well as a range of fruit and vegetable during the breeding season where the females are meant to lay eggs you should uh, add some calcium rich food for them so they have enough to produce a strong shell for the eggs it is recommended after the egg hatch that the new hatchlings get a high protein chick crumb mix uh, that can kind of uh, start their uh, digestive journey as to say it is also recommended that you mix it in with a little bit of water to soften it up it isn't diff uh, that we that we does this in captivity it's something we also do with baby pigs for instance in captivity just to make sure that their digestive system going specifically getting this softer food that don't have any hard edges or uh, kind of sharp anything that can um hurt their digestive systems as babies that would be pretty goddamn uh, awful uh, other sources do however uh, also recommend protein include uh, mealworms and various bugs and that's of course based on if you want to feed them very much like um 
what is practical to give them, which would be seeds and a basically chicken mix, <laughs> what is really easy to come by, or if you want to give them a more natural food source, which would be including these mealworms and various bugs, but a little more difficult to come by. Quills are one of the birds that are probably most famous for their fight of light response where most hunters will actually know this and that's why it can actually help on a hunt for these birds to have a kid or animal that can just run through the fields or run across the ground and affect this because the best instincts for these quills will be just to lay low lay low and stay hidden they will put out their uh, tail feathers only and then make kind of a kind of unique sound I, I'm not gonna do it but it's kind of a peeping call to let others know that there's danger uh, dangerous around but they will simply just hide and stay low and stay low and stay low so by having a dog or a kid or something noisy around the ground just running backwards or forwards at some point you will get so close that the bird will get scared and actually fly up and that's when you can shoot it uh, i'm not a hunter <laughs> but that's how i understand this works uh, these birds can, however, also choose to be aggressive, which is something mostly males that is against each other, uh, where they will kind of still squeeze a little down, where most animals actually try to appear bigger. They squeeze a little bit down, and then they will uh, put down their tail also, and then kind of attack from this very, very protected angle. Looking at these two different websites, according to the Animal Diversity website, these animals are not, or these birds are not listed either on the IUCN Red List or the Cities uh, List, which I believe is one specific for birds. Um, not completely sure, but it shouldn't be listed on either, but right below it, there's a um, graph where it's listed as a least concerned animal uh, according to the uh, animal.bio website it is also listed as a least concerned animal um, this is kind of very, very local logical since as already mentioned these are very very common in pet trade or in breeding trade those two are not always the same so if you want to have one of these just as home well i wouldn't never recommend just having one but if you want a few of them it is probably very plausible there can of course be some local rules in your country where they aren't allowed as pets but in general they should be quite easy to come by and therefore it would be really really weird if they were endangered that being said there is actually some animals that is extremely endangered in the wild but fairly common in captivity, but because of certain factors, they aren't that easy to just put back out into nature. Anyway, guys, we are at that time where it's time for me to shut up and time for you to enjoy the cinematics. I will, of course, come back afterwards.
Okay, guys, that seems to be it. I really hope you enjoyed it. And as always, guys, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notification so you know the next time I upload a video. I really hope to see you again either in the comments below or in the next video. Bye, guys.